Hello, Hi, hello. Everybody. Really nice to meet you. Nice yeah, to meet you yeah, too. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <sighs> Jason. If, if you get to film me, I get to film you. Oh. <laughs> Is, is all of this going to be on YouTube, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> is it? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, we'll I see know how, how much goes. time we have. It yeah. depends how bad it is. <laughs> um, so, Jason, I, I do want to start by orienting all of us a little bit. Yeah. Uh, especially for you know those of us who are not familiar. Uh, well, I'd with... be curious, like, how many people have watched not just bikes, the YouTube channel? Yeah, we, okay. Yeah, we got all right. a bunch of them. Yeah, we, you've right. got some fans. That's good. Like, how religiously? Like, one time uh, <laughs> you've watched one video? We, we, don't, we don't need okay, to. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need to pull the audience. I'm happy with people having watched it. Yeah, yeah. So for those of the, like, the, for the people who weren't familiar with it, what is Not Just Bikes? Why did you start it? Tell us, tell us the story. Uh, well, I'll try to tell it quickly. I mean, um, uh, the story goes just that my wife and I have lived all around the world. Uh, we had grown up in Canada, but uh, wanted to live somewhere else. Uh, so we moved to the UK and Taiwan and Belgium and uh, other places. And eventually, uh, after we had kids, decided you know it was time to move back to Canada to be closer to family. And we hated it. We absolutely <laughs> hated it. Like going from Canada wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> going from walkable urbanism that, and you know public functional public transit everything yeah. that we experienced in Europe and then going back to uh, Canada where even if you really try to carve out your little bit of walkability you're still surrounded by a mess of car dependent garbage yeah. and so um, so we didn't last very long and then it, we were saying look we're gonna move again but we can't we have kids we can't just keep jumping around the world so where are we gonna go so we spent a lot of time in research thinking about where was the best place for us, and ultimately that ended up being the Netherlands. So I started the YouTube channel uh, as a goal of sort of somebody else who might be from North America and might be thinking, you know, maybe there's a better place that I could be living, and that was the entire point. I was going to make 10, maybe 12 videos, that's it. The very first one was called this, actually. Um, and, uh, and, and that was really it. I, but, but then, Dutch people started watching it uh, and got, well, they, they learned all these things they didn't know about mm, their own cities. Mm -hmm. Lots of North Americans started watching it and so it expanded and I started expanding on other things about walkability and urban planning and even city finances and everything else and the channel has absolutely taken off and yeah. now it gets, you know, three to four million views yeah. a month and, yeah. and it's, it's crazy. It's actually the largest urban planning channel on YouTube now. Which is quite remarkable. That's a huge accomplishment. Well, Congratulations! Know, it's yeah, kind of accidentally. But. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions from that, but I'm going <laughs> to stick to my script for right now. Um, first of all, for the audience, how many of you are urban planners? Do we have any urban planners? Okay. Do we have any urban designers? Interesting. All right. So. Um, uh, the, uh, in your videos, you break down what makes cities suck or not. And yeah. I would love to have you share, especially with this audience, which we now know is not that many urban planners or designers, right. what are some of the main factors in urban planning and city design that make a city suck or not? Well, I mean, a lot of this is, um, it, it's, it's fairly basic. It's things that the, the urban planners all know, but the yeah. vast majority of people just don't. Yeah. And I think that's what I've found, is that most people don't know anything about urban planning. In fact, most people don't even know that cities are planned, yeah. period. Yeah. Um, so that's but not been, all cities are, right? Yeah, or, right. Yeah, or planned well, well I mean, or parts every, of cities. Yeah. It, it's remarkable because when you look at some like sprawling suburban mess of asphalt, people think, oh, geez, you know, like, this is capitalism gone crazy. There's, there's all these buildings here, and they're all garbage, and this is the problem. But every single thing you see right down to the color of the paint of the lines in the parking lot is defined somewhere. Like, we've defined what these cities are, and we've done it by designing four cars. And, I mean, fundamentally, a lot of this comes down to, as you've heard at this conference, designing for people or designing for cars. And it really fundamentally comes down to walkability versus car dependency. And I think that's the piece that's really starting to resonate with people, especially people who grew up in suburban North America, is that it's not so much the cars as it is the car dependency. And car dependency is terrible for everyone. Yeah. I mean, it really, really doesn't work for anybody, uh, no matter who you are. And this is like one of the things that I've said in my videos, that one of the things that you get here in the Netherlands, people talk about the freedom to drive, but what you get here and in other parts of Europe is you get the freedom to not to have to drive, mm. right? And mm -hmm. it's that 
that being forced to drive to do everything, even literally to feed your family, is, yeah. is insane. Yeah. But we've grown up with that in North America, and we don't even, we don't even think yeah. that, that anything different of that. Do you get a lot of nasty comments and emails and things like that? People saying, like, no, you're wrong. Of course. I don't it's believe you. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are any of them educated you know what responses, I, or are they just, you know, You know kind of what's nasty really friends? interesting to me is that um, there are, I mean, complete, willfully ignorant, ignorant yeah. morons out yeah. there. I mean, as I said, it is YouTube. You ever been to a YouTube's <laughs> comment section? I mean, Jesus, it's toxic. But what I have been surprised about is how receptive so many mm. people are to it, because I think. Um, there's this like joke that people say they've been orange pilled, like they, <laughs> they, what, what they is suddenly. That? Can, you, can you describe what that means? I've never heard that before. They suddenly like they they had this feeling okay. in the back of their mind that that something isn't quite right. You know, they they're 15 years old and they're trapped in their suburban uh, home and they're yeah. waiting for their parents to yeah. come home to drive them somewhere. Sure. And this all feels wrong, yeah. but they don't they don't know why. Yeah. They don't know how the vocabulary to explain yeah. it. Yeah. I think. So a lot of the comments are actually more along that, that it's like, holy crap, this explains my whole life, or this explains my whole experience when I went here or there or whatever. For the first time, I finally understand why I liked this place and I hated that place. Um, and it really does come down to the way that these places are designed. Do you have to do a bunch of research in order to figure out the different regulations, actors, history, you know, yeah. all of the... I mean, for sure. That we um, kind of take for granted as we're just walking down the street. Well, I'm not an urban planner. Yeah, uh, But right. I play one on YouTube. Yeah. Right? But, um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I mean, you, keep this in mind when you're watching YouTube videos. Anybody can put a YouTube video up there. Um, we, we but yeah, so I do a lot of research. But one of the things that I really focus on on my channel, like there's another, um, there's another urban planning channel, the, the second largest, called City Beautiful, which is yeah, well worth watching. It's great. It's great. It was made by an actual urban planner. He teaches uh, uh, in California. And, uh, and it's phenomenal. And he has a lot of really good information about urban planning. But my channel is not so much about urban planning as the experience of being in different urban environments. So I mm -hmm. definitely do the research and talk about urban planning topics. But that's not really what I'm there to do. Yeah. I am not there to teach you urban planning. And, I'm really there because I have traveled to, I don't know what it is, 665 countries in the world, hundreds and hundreds of cities. I've lived in many different cities. I've traveled uh, for business, for pleasure. I've been to places where you would never go, like you know, factories in Shenzhen and things like that uh, in, in my time. So I've okay. seen a lot of different places. So what I'm really yeah. trying to share is more my experiences with these places yeah. and what all of this stuff that comes together, all of these rules and all of this urban design, when it all comes together, what's it actually like for the person that's there? Like, for instance, I don't really make videos a lot about necessarily climate change or, or um, you know, anything like that, but I do it tangentially to that because it's all about the experience. Like, people can say, we should build more bike lanes because sure. people are healthier yeah. or something, or it's better for the environment, and that's, I mean, that's fine. But I almost don't care about that. I want to say we should build cities this way because they are better yeah. places to yeah. be. Yeah. Like they are fundamentally better places to be. There, there's this kind of universal thing I've seen across every city I've ever been to in the world is that the more car friendly a place is, the, the, the shittier it is to actually be there. And, and I think that's universal a, across absolutely everything. Like yeah. you'd, rather, you'd rather be in a park than on a parkway, right? So I, I think it's, it's that experience that I'm really trying to get across more than anything else. If you want to learn about city planning, you and I send people over to City Beautiful. Yeah. He knows what he's talking about. <laughs> I was actually going to follow up with a question about whether or not you two are friends or love, oh, you're yeah, like yeah, frenemies. Oh, yeah, yeah, No, we are. Compete. We talk all the time. You know, actually. Do you really? OK. Oh, all the time, yeah. yeah. We're, uh, <laughs> we're actually both part it's of delightful. the same organization called Standard, which is a group of educational YouTube creators. Um, okay. And we're on Nebula, there, um, if oh. the, the streaming service, the subscription streaming okay. service. And so we do literally talk regularly. Yeah, and yeah. this is one thing I've learned is that YouTubers all talk to each other. Mm. There are Twitter DMs, there are Slack DMs. They are all talking to each other all the time. Hmm. It's, it's kind of like having coworkers, and it's really weird. Okay. And how does it translate to other platforms? Like, are you all also on TikTok? Do you? Yes. Um, I'm. I am on other platforms, although my real main focus is YouTube because YouTube Why? has um, 
the way YouTube is structured is very different than all the rest of them. Okay. Um, there's lots of reasons around it that aren't worth getting into. Sure. But, uh, but audience is an important part. It's of about it, right? the audience. It's about the funding model. It's yeah. about the way that the the algorithm works. Everything that it is just better suited to longer form educational mm -hmm. content. Mm -hmm. It really mm -hmm. is. Like it's. And who is your audience when you break down the people who are following you, whatever? So my audience is. Um, most of them are under 35. Is that intentional too? Well, a little bit. So yeah. in the very first line of my first video, this one here, if you watch this on YouTube, I, I say, uh, this is the video I wish I could have seen 20 years yeah. ago because it, would, because it would have saved me a lot of time figuring out where I wanted to live. Yeah. And so uh, my target from the start was me 20 years ago. That's what I say my target audience is. So like me in my 20s, I'm in university, I don't know where I want to live. But not in the world of 20 years ago. Because no, we're not now in the 20, world of 20 years but ago. But we're 2022 now, if, yeah, I guess. If is, it were me, if I were yeah. in my 20s. Yeah. And, and it does seem to really resonate with that audience yeah. more than anyone else. I mean, lots of people like the content. It's definitely clear. But the vast majority of them are in their 20s, maybe um, early 30s. They've grown up in a suburban car centric environment. Yeah. It's all they've ever known. Yeah. Maybe they've gone to college and it's their very first time they've ever experienced anything walkable in their life. Yeah. Because college is the first time you've actually been able to go walk to something ever mm. um, for these people. And, and this is like the channel that they watch and suddenly it all opens up. Well, what's your goal? I mean, are you trying to get everybody to move to Amsterdam? Or are you trying to create <laughs> cities that uh, well, are great everywhere? I mean, my original goal <laughs> was there was no real goal. It was, it was I did a bunch of research so to decide to where I yeah. wanted to live yeah. and it was here and here's why. Okay. That's it. Yeah. And then I wanted to educate people about the thought process that led up to it. But I think if there's any sort of goal, it really is that me 20 years ago, I want to go to people in their 20s and I want them to skip all the crap that I had to go to to learn what I know today, to experience what I had today. That's really what I want to do. I want them to understand that car dependency is not the only way to live. Yeah. I want them to understand the benefits of being in walkable environments, yeah. mixed use walkable environments. And to a certain extent, what they do with that information is entirely up to them. Hmm, I don't want to tell them. Like, obviously, the my, my decision to was say to no. leave, yeah. to yeah. say, screw North America, yeah. I'm out of here. And, um, and that was my decision. But ultimately, if that spurs people to advocacy in their own city, yeah. that's fantastic. If it spurs them to move to a different city within their own state, also fantastic, right? All of these things are fantastic outcomes, but I'm not here to tell them what they need to do. Mm. All I need them to know is that what they've experienced their entire life is not is a choice. the only way to yeah. live. Yeah, and was a series of choices made by yes, people exactly. And in I do order talk to a lot about history for yeah. exactly that reason yeah. because this is a choice. Yeah, like when people come to me and they say, "Oh, geez, we, you know, we can't have trains in the United States. It's too big." I mean, the whole freaking country was built on trains. There were trains going to we every trains, single yeah. city in the United States. Yeah. They are all built on trains, and then they all had streetcars, and they were all torn out about 70 years ago. So you can't come and tell me the country can't be built on trains when it was literally built on trains. Yeah. So it's a choice, and that's also what people have to understand. Yeah. We, it doesn't have to be this way, and it doesn't have to stay this way. You talk about two different kinds of environments, and given how many places you've traveled to, moved to, you've lived in what, what I'm going to describe as two different environments. And one is the environment that's uh, built, that's developed. It's developed maybe in a certain way with yeah. pavement and everything else and housing and sprawled patterns. And then there's the environment that's not yet built and getting built very rapidly, either formally or informally. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to hear in like maybe answer this question twice. So once for more of this uh, already developed city and another for a developing city or a growing city. Um, what do you see as some of the things that are easy to retrofit? And what do you see as some of the things that need to be done now in order to avoid all that hassle later? Well, I mean, fundamentally, cities were built a certain way for a very long time, thousands of years. They, they didn't change significantly. They were built around constraints of how far people could walk and travel and, and things like that. Um, so when, when we talk about like walkable cities, a lot of people from North America think this is some new concept, but it's really just the way we've been doing things yeah. forever. It's it, like, like the organization Strong Towns, which I work with, who are yeah. a, um, who work a lot in 
city advocacy and financial uh, security of cities. They talk about the suburban experiment. That's the strange part. Mm. The really doing things in the car-centric suburban way in, in this course of history is the weird thing. So I think to a certain extent, it's, it's looking at all of these decisions that we made to make cars the exclusive way of getting around or to highly prioritize them at the top of the stack yeah. and getting rid of a lot of that. Looking back on that last 70 years and saying, okay, I get it. We were really excited about this new technology called cars, but we screwed up. We went too far. Well, this pendulum swung too far and bringing it back the other way. And I think ah, that's really, it's, it's not that complicated. It's really, really not. Um, in terms of like new developing cities, I think we just need to go back to allowing mixed use walkable neighborhoods. We need to design um, public transit along with good land use so that it's not just a bus that takes you to the side of a six lane strobe, yeah, right? Yeah. Like it, it takes you somewhere that you want to go. And, and I think these are not new concepts, but they're just a bit hard for us to handle if we've only grown up knowing knowing the car dependent alternative. Yeah. I mean I, I really, really want to stress that this is not as complicated as some people make it out to be. Yeah. And I feel like in the context of this micro mobility conference, any kind of mobility solution that's it just has to be compatible with walking. Mm -hmm. I mean I think that's it. Design for walking and walkability for, for, for people to walk and roll, roll wheelchairs, such. And then anything that's compatible with that is perfectly fine. Mm. And, and I think that's, if you use that as your sort of guiding light for designing the city, then you're not going to go that wrong. Yeah. Uh, you talk a lot about Amsterdam. We're in Amsterdam. This is my first time to here. Amsterdam. You do live here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we've established that. Uh, and I have been trying to think of things I don't like about Amsterdam because mm. it is quite a charming city. I've been walking around a lot. Um, experienced it by bike, ferry, whatever, but there's no perfect city. So tell me about some of the things that suck about Amsterdam and why. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. You're allowed to sprinkle in a few good things, but mostly I want to hear about the things that are terrible. It is, why you think it it is hard for me to talk about what's bad about Amsterdam because it seems almost petty. Um, mm. Because... We can be petty. Well, no, yeah. I, don't, I don't even mean it. Well, I guess I don't mean petty so much as like, like I'll complain about something and then someone who lives almost anywhere else would be like, you're complaining about that? I mean, come on. Uh, I mean, like, for example, I went to, I, I talked to many Dutch people who live in Amsterdam. I mean, people outside of Amsterdam hate it, but that's the big city concept. Mm. People outside of Toronto hate Toronto in Canada. People outside of like, it, you know, whatever, Sydney hate it in Australia. People outside of Taipei hate it in the rest of Taiwan. It's universal. Mm. But I mean, of people who live in Amsterdam, I ask them what they don't like, and there'll be things like, oh, you know, there's, there's too many cars on this street, or the, this bike path is too narrow, and like... It's very specific. It's, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's like, when I show those examples, people are like, give me a break. Um, <laughs> I mean, no, but the city is not perfect. I actually think the public transit here is not as good as it could be, and I think it's actually held back by the fact that the cycling is so good. Yeah. You know, I just got back from a week in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, where- Where in Switzerland? I was uh, in uh, Zurich, Bern, Basel, Zurich, some of the mountains. Yeah. But I did one week where I was traveling on trains multiple times a day. Mm. Like I traveled all around, I, was, I filmed 800 gigabytes of video uh, for upcoming videos. And I mean, in, in a Swiss city, the trams are coming by every few seconds. Yeah. Uh, they will connect me to train stations that will take me anywhere in the country with a few minutes wait. Um, they are timed with absolute perfect Precision. Swiss watch um, timing so yeah. that when I arrive at, um, at, a, at a station, I've got eight minutes to make it to the other platform to take my train on to the next connection. And I think that level of integration with public transit is phenomenal. And, I mean, I, and I've said in my videos, like, I'm, I'm not a cyclist. I actually don't care about bicycles. I ride a bicycle every day almost. But if I had the choice of taking a tram or a bicycle, I would take a tram every time. Hmm. I actually think um, a high-quality public transportation system is more compatible with a walkable city. I think trams are like a, like a range extender for walking. Yeah. You should have, you know, be in a walkable place, you should be able to walk to what you need, and then if it's a little bit farther, you hop on a tram to get there. And I think that's something that Swiss cities do much better. And, mm. and I think the Netherlands does that well, but it doesn't do its public transportation as well as it should. 
one last thing. Like I came up here on the on the M52, the new Metro, yeah. and it leaves every six minutes, which I just don't think is good enough. I, re I mean, I really don't. Like having to wait six minutes for like a brand I'm new be Metro. I feel like a person from your video who's like, you know what, that is good enough. Six know, minutes right? is good enough. Yeah. But you know, in, in many other cities in the world on a yeah. brand new Metro system, I wouldn't have to wait more yeah. than a minute or two. Yeah. And Jason, I'm going to ask you a last question. We had the deputy mayor of Amsterdam here yesterday welcoming everybody to Amsterdam. Oh, yeah. And one of the questions from the audience to him was, when are you going to let e-scooters in Amsterdam? Yes. What is your take? Should e-scooters be allowed in Amsterdam? Well, I, I mean, like I said, my fundamental belief about all this is every mobility solution has to be compatible with walking. If it's compatible with walking, then I'm fine with it. And if it's not, then I'm not. And e-scooters seem perfectly compatible okay. with walking to right. me. I was wondering where um, you were going to go with that. And that, it, eventually I'll need to make a video about that, but that whole uh, e-scooters <laughs> is, and many of these micro-mobility things that we see here, they're what, the, what I've called in-between vehicles. It's like we haven't designed for them, and they kind of fit in between a couple of different things. In many different cities, bicycles are in-between vehicles. Yeah. You know, they've designed sidewalks for walking. They've designed uh, big, wide roads for cars and bicycles don't fit. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that people are like, they should get out of here, yeah. they should be licensed, they should be, like, we should get rid of these things, whatever, right? And here, the in-between vehicle is that, mm -hmm. is that scooter and mm -hmm. other things like it. But we have to learn how to deal with these things yeah. because um, they, they are here, they are, they're not going away, and they're, quite frankly, perfectly reasonable ways to get around, so. Sounds like you might need to, I know I've given you like a homework assignment, but it sounds like you might need to create this video. I've got a, I've got a list of yeah. 300 videos long, but I'll put it, I'll put it on, it's already on there. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining me on stage, for yeah, being our sure. last conversation of the day. Um, I know I enjoyed it. So let's do a round of applause uh, for Jason and for um, all of the work that you're doing.